Hello, everybody. God bless you today. This is Susan Puzio, and I want to welcome you to the Prophetic News Radio Program. And we're heard now, all our new programs are heard on Spreaker. We're no longer broadcasting on Blog Talk Radio. There are some of our old programs there, but our new platform is Spreaker, and that's S P R E A K E R. And we're also on iTunes and some other platforms. But if you search Prophetic News Radio, it'll bring up our programs and it'll take you to the sites, okay? So also we have our YouTube channel, Greedy Preachers TV, and there's plenty of greedy preachers out there. They're crazier than ever. And... Uh, We have our Prophetic News TV also on YouTube. And we have our website, Prophetic News. Also, our two books, don't forget our very important book now that former President Trump is running again for office. I have written an expose on Paula White, his supposed pastor and spiritual advisor, That book is available on Amazon. It's called President Trump's Pastor, Paula White. The Miracle-Selling Huckster, who became the spiritual advisor to the world's most powerful man. And you could ask yourself, how does that happen? (laughs) Yeah, some of us are still scratching our heads. And we also have Seed Faith, Can a Man Bribe God? How False Teachers Manipulate and Hypnotize You for Offerings. And... As I'm scrolling through the channels on the so-called Christian networks and I see what's going on, it's such an abomination and an affront to Jesus Christ. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. So as ministers of the gospel, we don't need to beg, borrow, and steal from people to get to fund our ministries. And that's mainly what's going on. It's so awful. And I hope I can spend the rest of my life trying to put a dent into all of this anyway. It's just horrible. But we have a very special guest for you today. We're going to bring on Russell Kelly in a few minutes, who's a teach, who teaches on tithing, and uh, he is an expert on uh, the lie of the tithe. Let's call it that, the lie of the tithe. Because we... We give freely as New Testament believers, and of course, we know that tithing was never money anyway in the Old Testament, but some pastors don't know the truth. If they don't know, then you can send them this program and ask them to please listen to it and check out the scriptures, and then they're responsible for the knowledge that they have, that they teach teach it correctly. But anyway, here's Malachi 3. Chapter 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. 
return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. We so still I'm have bringing a... my uh, guest on here, Russell Kelly. Hi, Russ. Hi, Susan. Oh, friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, old friend is right. Anyway, you haven't been on our program for a while, so introduce yourself to the people. Tell you how. Tell the people how you're a little bit about your background and how you got into this whole thing about tithing. <laughs> well, I, I will be seventy-eight on the 12th and uh, so i'm getting old <laughs> yeah yeah we're in, uh, tell me about i'm that. a <laughs> i'm a what we call a fundamental dispensational conservative baptist and uh most of them teach tithing yeah not all of them but most of them do and uh my father used to teach sunday school and had the best class in church and one day he he worked two jobs and had six children. One day they told him that uh, he wasn't tithing and he couldn't teach Sunday school anymore, and it really destroyed him. He yeah. he went on a drinking binge and all, and ended up committing suicide. As a matter of fact, oh no! And, and when I had an opportunity to um, do a dissertation for a PhD, I I said I would choose that subject, and I did, and I looked at. I am very, very thorough. I look at every commentary on I can find pro or con, and I must have had a, a hundred books on the shelf at one time. Yeah. Uh, so I know the subject very well, and just recently I've I've really honed in on one verse, Malachi three ten, and I want to discuss that today. And I think that that one verse is self-destructive to anybody that teaches tithing. I want to look at it in great detail today. Okay. I, uh, according to your, written, your studies, how many, uh, when did they institute, do you know when they at, when churches started teaching this whole 10% monetary tithe? Well, it began being taught in the Catholic Church in the 60s. 600s, the Catholic Church no longer teaches it, as a matter of fact. Uh, the English started teaching it uh, as, a, as a food crop, you know, that they, the, part of the reason for the Irish coming to the United States is the, the British wanted to make them pay tithes on potatoes and stuff like that, and they just couldn't do it. Uh, but in the United States, the early colonists did not teach tithing. They taught, they sort of rented pews out or up to the town, paid the preacher's salary until the late 1800s. 
uh, around the 1870s to 1895, they started studying it seriously, and the churches slowly started teaching tithing. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, pretends like they've always taught it, but they really haven't. If you look at their statement of faith, uh, the the word doesn't even appear in their uh, statement of faith. I, I think it's 1963 statement doesn't even have the word tithe in it. Uh, later on in the statement, they add it to it. So uh, we're we're led to assume that most people teach it. Well, that's not true. Well, you uh, said that they studied it seriously, but it doesn't sound like they studied it yeah. seriously enough. Yeah. <laughs> to well, their benefit, to their benefit. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So uh, uh, tell us about your books. I have written three. I, I spend more time on eschatology than I do tithing, by the way. I'm not totally in this, you know, teaching that all the time. Yeah. Uh, I book from Gethsemane to Ascension. It's a series of Easter plays, and it includes every text in the Bible from the Gethsemane on that deals with Christ, and it's very thorough. Uh, I have a book from um, uh, Exposing Seventh-day Adventism. I was at Seventh-day Adventist for a few years in the 80s, uh, and the, my major book is Should the Church Teach Tithing? A Theologian's Conclusions About a Taboo Doctrine. That was my Ph.D. dissertation at Covington Theological Seminary in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Yeah. So and, it sounds uh, like you're, you're well-versed. <laughs> afterwards, Dr. David Cruteau, uh decided from reading my book that he was going to do his dissertation on it. And it's been a long time since people have done Ph.D. dissertations on tithing. And I, I, I recommend seminaries and Bible schools uh, assign it more often, and they'll be surprised what they come out teaching. <laughs> yeah, well, that, it, they should, because it's so prevalent today, the uh, 10% monetary tithe, and you, you've got so many scoundrels out there uh, trying to destroy the church. Of course, they, they can't, but they're, they're trying to do a pretty good job of it with their greed. Well, can we get right into it with Malachi? Yeah. Malachi 3.10 says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. And I have just spent two days looking up at least 50 Bible commentaries, Bible dictionaries, and every single one of them focuses on the word tithe, on the word all. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. And they said the the sin was that they weren't bringing it all in there; that they were keeping some of it home somewhere else. And I I, I really think uh, if I was the judge, uh, a lawyer in a in a courtroom case, I, this could be blown out of com- common sense so easy. Uh, you live in Florida, right? Yeah. Uh, the capital of Florida is, if I'm not mistaken, is Gainesville. No, it's Tallahassee, I think. I'm sorry, Tallahassee. You're right, Tallahassee. I shouldn't have said I was born and raised in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and the capital of Georgia was Atlanta, and the capital of Tennessee is Nashville. Well, what if the tithe was only food from inside Israel in the Old Testament? It was never money. But so when you look at that text, and, and it says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. That means all, 100%. Don't keep any of it back for yourselves. That's what all of the commentaries say the, the problem was. Yeah. Well, let's say you live in, you live near Sweetwater in Tampa, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Let's say you lived in Tampa or Miami and your church and you were a pastor. And your church says says all of the members of a denomination like this, your own church, bring all the tithe into Tallahassee, all the food into Tallahassee. Or if you lived in Georgia and lived in Valdosta or Savannah or Brunswick, 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles from Atlanta. And your church said, bring all the food ties to Atlanta. Or you lived in Nashville. In, in, uh, you lived in Tennessee. And you lived in, in Chattanooga or something, two or three hundred miles away. And your church said, bring all the food ties to Nashville. None of us would do that. We would instantly rebel, would we not? Yeah. Because <laughs> every time you every time you needed food, you would have to go to Tallahassee in, from Florida, or Atlanta from Valdosta, Georgia, or you'd have to go to uh, Nashville if you live somewhere else in Tennessee. Nobody would fall for that today. They would say something's wrong with this picture. Right? Yeah. Well, why didn't they? Why don't they? Anybody? You know, I'm one person on Earth out of billions of people, and I'm one commentator out of thousands and thousands of Bible commentators. And why am I the only person who's ever pointed this out that that doesn't make sense? Yeah. If God told all the people of Israel, to bring all the ties to the to Jerusalem, and you lived in Bethlehem or Hebron or Jericho or you know Capernaum or somewhere else, you would say that's crazy. How, am I supposed to go to the Jerusalem every time I need some food to eat? Right? <laughs> yeah. Do you do you, do you see my complaint? Yeah. It does not make sense. If that text is literally telling everybody in Israel or Judea to bring the whole ties to Jerusalem, I mean, I'd hate to be a priest living in Jericho, which is you know twenty five hundred feet further downhill, further away, and thirty forty miles away. Every time I needed some food, I've got to go up to the temple in Jerusalem to get it and bring it back home. <laughs> no, nobody would, nobody would fall for that today. I don't know. <laughs> they fall yet, for the 10%. Yet they say, so the text doesn't make there's some, something wrong with the text. Now, let me jump from Malachi 3.10 to uh, 1 Kings 6.6. 6. I'm not going to read the text. I'm just going to refer to it. In 1 Kings 6.6, 6, we have a description of the chambers built around the sides of the temple. Uh, one of them was five cubits or seven and a half feet wide. The other was seven, which was about ten and a half feet wide. And the other was uh, uh, the other was nine. Or, in other words, the 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 buildings built around the temple were not big enough to hold the ties, even even when they had the whole nation. You got to realize. Uh, Solomon died around 930, and at that time, they had 12 tribes or 13 tribes to uh, bring the tithe to Jerusalem. Yeah. Well, they didn't do it. They did not. They never brought the tithe. Nowhere in the Bible, other than Malachi 3.10, does anybody ever bring the whole tithe to the temple? Nowhere. There's not a command in the law to do it. Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? No. Except for Malachi three ten, there's no other text in the Bible that says that, because it doesn't make sense. Now let's go back to Second Chronicles thirty one. I'm going to tell you a story of Hezekiah. Okay. In Second Chronicles thirty one, King Hezekiah around this is two or three hundred years after the temple was built. It is still Solomon's temple. It's still the original temple. Solomon built. Hezekiah wants to have a revival. So he tells the people of Judah, only Judah, because the other the other tribes have disappeared in seven twenty two BC. So he tells the people of Judah to bring all the tithe to Jerusalem. And then the Bible says that for three months they brought the tithe to Jerusalem and they piled it up in the street in heaps. That's in Second Chronicles 31. It okay. says tithes was in heaps, H-E-A-P-S. Big Second old Chronicles 21, and what, what's 31. the verse? Oh, 31. 31. What's the verse? 31. So 
why was it in heats in the streets of Jerusalem uh, when Solomon's temple was there? Did not Solomon build silos and grain and places to put the tithe? He must not have. The answer is no, because the, the people had no place to put it, and they put it in big old stacks to rot out in the middle of the street and the weather and rats and everything else eating it. And the Bible says that Solomon called the priests and the Levites together, and he questioned them. Well, what Hezekiah realized is something's wrong with this picture. <laughs> if if we're supposed to bring all the tithe to the temple in Jerusalem, then why do we not have any place to put it? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it was, it was out in the middle of the streets of Jerusalem in big piles of food. And, and Hezekiah didn't know what to do with it. So it says he calls the Levites and the priests together and they very quickly built some uh, chambers, uh, some storerooms to hold some of the tithe. Okay. But what we're not told is if you keep on reading the chapter, when you get to verse 19 and 20, it says he sent the rest of it back to the Levitical cities where the priests and the Levites lived. Yeah. Now, why did they do that? Because that's where it belonged to start with. <laughs> yeah. Now, are you following me? Yeah. I, I'm was interested no because I've never heard anybody use that term about the heaps. So that's that's the a heap. new one for me. Oh, it's in the Bible. It's a biblical term. Yeah, I term. see it. I see it. But I never looked at it before. So here we have the original temple that Solomon built. And evidently, there's no place in that temple anywhere to store the tithes of the whole nation. So why would God tell you to bring the whole tithe to, to, to the temple in Jerusalem when there's no place to put it? Yeah. And why did after after Hezekiah questioned them, did they turn around and redistribute it to the Levitical cities? You got me? Yeah. Now we're going to look at another text, Nehemiah 10. Okay, Nehemiah 10. Nehemiah 10, verses 35 to 39. Now I'm not going. I'm not going to read the text. You, you write it down, and if there's anybody listening, want to question it, read it, read it for yourself. In Nehemiah 10 verses 35 to 39, Nehemiah the governor says to bring the first fruits. In verses 35 and 36, he said, "Bring the first fruits to the temple to the priest." Yeah. So they can have it to eat. That's what they ate while they were serving there one week at a time and then he gets down to verse 36 and 37 and 38 and he says and bring the tithe to the levitical cities where they where the levites and priests live so here in other words he did the same thing that hezekiah figured out after he questioned the levites and the priests he said the bring the first fruits to the temple bring the tithe to the Levitical city. You, you got that? Yeah. Which, in other words, bring the whole tithe into the temple makes no sense if you if it belongs in the Levitical cities where the Levites and the priests lived and where they needed it for food. Yeah. Well, in Solomon's time, there was 48 Levitical cities. This is found in Joshua chapter 20 and 21. Joshua there was 20 four, and 21, okay. There's four, there were 48 Levitical cities. So the people would bring their tithes to those 48 Levitical cities, uh, their first tithe. The second tithe, they would bring uh, three times a year to the feast, and, the, and they would have a, a, a potluck feast in the streets of Jerusalem. There was a third tithe. They, they ate every three years, and they kept it at home, and they gave it to the strangers and the Levites and the priests. So. None of none of the tithes was there's none of the tithes was ever stored in the storehouse. So what <laughs> do we do with this verse? What do we do with this verse? Yeah. Bringing all the tithes into the storehouse. Yeah. Well, in Nehemiah thirteen, Nehemiah thirteen, okay, we see what's going on. Uh Nehemiah goes off to uh 
to Persia, you know, to serve the governor for a while. And while he's gone, uh, verse 5 says uh, his his enemy, Tobias, uh, was moved into the large chamber in the temple. Yeah. Where the where the the tithe was stored. Well, we're talking about a room that's probably about twenty by twenty at the most, at the very most, because that's the largest chamber, and it was a double chamber, a double room. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a big room, but it's not going to hold all the tithes of the whole nation, because I mean we're talking about heaps of tithes in the street, so. That room, the tithes that it held were only to feed the priests who came to Jerusalem every 24th week. They served one, one week at a time. Yeah, it says here that uh, it was given to the Levites, the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priests. Okay. Those are Levites. The singers and the porters are, are, are Levites. Oh, okay. And... So the priest took the tithes out of out of those that room, and they hid it somewhere. They and, and they moved Tobias into the room. Well, Nehemiah comes back from his service in Persia, and he realizes that hey, the temple's been shut down. All the Levites have gone home. Well, why did the Levites go home? Because they had no food to eat. It didn't say the priest had gone home. The priest had taken the tithe out of the storerooms for themselves. The Levites had nothing to eat. The Levites went home. That's the story there. Yeah. So who who had stolen the tithe? The priest had. Yeah. In Malachi 3, he says, you have robbed me. <laughs> this whole nation of you. Which really means this whole nation, every priest in the nation is complicit in this sin. Yeah, now, uh, they the tell, now they tell the congregants that they're robbing God. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no, that's what I, no, that's the whole problem we've got. In, in, in Malachi 1, verse 6, <laughs> first chapter, verse 6, yeah. God begins speaking to the priest. This is for you, O priest. And he chews them out for not bringing the correct sacrifices. Again, in Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he's still saying, and I'm still talking to you, O priest. He said, I hate you. you have, I will spread dung in your faces at your feet. So God has is, is cursed the priest four times in Malachi chapter 1 and chapter 2. He's already used the word curse four times. Yeah. In chapter three, I contend that God is still talking to the priest. They're still the bad guys because he's already cursed them four times. And when he says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, the ye is the priest who had taken the tithes out of the storehouse in Nehemiah 13, 5. Yeah. So he's not talking to the whole nation of Israel, which makes sense out of the text. Are you following me? Yeah. If bring ye the whole tithe into the storehouse is only directed to the priest who took it out of the storehouse, then it makes sense. He is merely telling them to bring the tithe that you stole from the Levites back. Yeah. Bring it back. So the Levites will come back so we can open the temple again, so we can start worshiping again. That is Russ Kelly's interpretation of Malachi, the whole book of Malachi. As a matter of fact, in that book, I, I have a commentary on the whole book to show that that's the way it goes. Yeah. God never, God never stopped speaking to the priest whom he cursed four times in Malachi 1, in Malachi 2, and he's still cursing in, in Malachi 3. He's not talking to the rest of the nation. He's only talking to the priest. Yeah. And anybody that will sit down and read the whole book, it, it's 
My gosh, it's four chapters long. You can read it in 10 minutes. Yeah. And nobody ever reads the rest of the book to see what's going on. Well, they're, if, they're, if they have uh, the disease I call pastoritis and they go every Sunday and they don't ever crack the Bible, they just believe everything the pastor tells them. So why read Ma- the whole book of Malachi when they're pounded every week in the, with Malachi 3? Every week. Yeah. 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 The, the verse in the Bible, the, the chapter in the Bible that deals with tithing is, is more in, in great detail is Numbers 18. Okay. Not Malachi 3. And how many times have you ever heard a sermon on tithing from Numbers 18? I, I don't remember ever when I was going to churches ever here in Numbers 18. Malachi 3, <laughs> that was the standard every Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in Numbers 18, verse 20, God says, uh, the Levites and the priests shall not have any land. They will, cannot inherit land in Israel. Yeah. And it says, neither, neither shall you have any portion with them. In other words, you can't share in their wealth either. Yeah. Yeah. He's telling the Levites and the priests, you cannot own land in Israel. You cannot amass wealth in Israel. I do not intend for you to ever get rich. That's, in the, <laughs> that's, that's repeated nine times in the Old Testament. Yeah. Nine times. That God does not intend for the Levites and the priests to, get, to ever amass wealth to get rich. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Imagine wow. that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, and, it's all twisted today. <laughs> and, and, and then in the next four verses, he says, now the people, each tribe, each tribe will send a, a tithe of the, of the food in Israel to the Levites. Because instead of owning land, your inheritance, your, instead of having land inheritance, your inheritance will be the tithe. Yeah. So he said, this, so the tithe is yours, the Levites. Now the Levites were not the preachers. They were not the, the uh, they were not the uh, the ministers of the sanctuary that ministered the blood. They were the housekeepers. They were the mule skinners. Uh, they were the janitors. They were the guards. They were the singers. They did everything in the temple except minister the blood. They were not the ministers. Who, they who got the, tithe. the blood. They got the tithe. Now, the next four verses, Numbers 18, verses 25 to 28, God says, now the Levites will give a tenth of what they receive to the priest. What is a tenth of a tenth? One percent. One percent, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Here's a chapter that deals with tithing in great detail. It says that the priest will only get 1% of the tithe. One, not 10%, 1%. Yeah. 1%. That's also repeated in Nehemiah 10.38, by the way. 1%. 1%. Uh, I've never heard that pointed out either. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, why, why point these things out when it's so lucrative to collect 10% from your congregants? <laughs> there's, another, there's another cog in the machine. It's in Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, verses 20 and 21, they come up to Jesus and they ask him to give some money. Yeah. And... <laughs> You've heard sermons on this, but you've never heard this this sermon I'm going to give you right now. Okay. <laughs> and he, they ask him, who does it belong? Who does, who does that m- Roman money belong to? Because they're carrying Roman money in their pocket. Yeah. And, and Jesus says, and who does this belong to? And they, verse 21, Matthew 22, 21, they say unto him, Caesar. Yeah. No, he says, whose image is on this coin? And they said, Caesar. Then he says, uh, whose writing is on this coin? And they said, Caesar's, right? Yeah. And he tells them, 
Render under Caesar that which is Caesar's. Yeah. Is Jesus not literally telling them, if it's got Caesar's picture on it and Caesar's writing on it, you cannot give it to God, you cannot give it to bring to the temple. Wow. Is he not saying that? Wow, yeah. Is he not? Huh? Yeah. What what they did was the you could only bring temple money to the temple or else use the, the temple shekel. So when they went to the, the money changers and they gave them Caesar's money, oh. the, the Levites would give them monopoly money, <laughs> paper money. So that, that money. was temple money that they could bring, but not Caesar's they money. Could, they could bring temple money that was minted in the temple, the shekel, or they could change it for monopoly money. That's why Jesus overturned the tables twice. It was money changing. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You could not bring real money into the temple. Wow. Now, what do we do today? Whose pictures on our, our, our money? George Washington, <laughs> Benjamin Frank, Franklin, and Abraham what, Lincoln. What language is on our money? English. It's not pictures of temple things that you'd see in, on the shekel. And it's not in Hebrew. No. If we were to literally interpret that text, and I've never heard a preacher do this when he preached, oh, render unto God that which is God. And by that he means give God 10% of your money. Yeah. But Jesus, but Jesus says you don't get that money. <laughs> the, the whole system is corrupt. It's oh, just, I, I can't believe it. And, We've got a long way to go because we, I, I've been talking about it for years and so have you, and we're, we haven't even put a dent into uh, these scoundrels and the way that they're robbing God's people and taking advantage of God's people. And, and yet, of course, God's people are responsible for reading the Bible for themselves and finding out what the truth is. And, and if they're going to these churches, they need to leave. They can't stay with these crooks. Well. But I don't know. I don't understand. We're supposed to be in the Bible Belt, you know, in the South. I wonder how many people have actually read all four chapters of Malachi. Read them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Read them one verse at a time. Without but, what the pastor has told them in their head, because they, they, yeah. they've every Sunday when I would go to church. That was what they would tell you every Sunday, Malachi three, and that your curse. So you get that in your head, it's, and then it's hard to kind of to get it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, if if Malachi three says you are cursed with a curse, yeah. It, and and Malachi chapter one says the priests are cursed because they weren't bringing. He said, "You have in your flock that which is good and healthy, and you bring me." the sick and the lame and the maimed and the blind. He said, you're cursed. You're cursed for the curse. He's cursing the the priest for, who had good, and healthy animals in their flock. You know why? The, the Levites, when they gave a tithe of the tithe to the priest, they were to give the best, the best. And that's another thing. If you read the original description of tithing in Leviticus 27, verses 29 to 34. Yeah. Leviticus 27, verses 29 to 34. Okay. It says, when you give a tithe of the animals, you don't give the best. It specifically says, don't give the best. <laughs> give every tenth animal. They go through, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, number ten. Not the best. Do not just do not give the best. Give every tenth. Uh, and then it says when in in Numbers eighteen twenty five to twenty eight again, when the Levites give a tithe to the priest of what they receive, they are to give the best. So the priest had the best of the best animals. Yeah. It, and God in, in Malachi chapter 1 chews out the priest and curses them for not bringing the best. He says, you have it in your herds. You have the best good animals, and you're bringing me the, the crumbs. <laughs> and, and then in chapter 2, 
in, in chapter two of, Ma- of, of Malachi, please people, please people, read Malachi. It, it'll, it'll just up up upend everything you've ever heard about in chapter three. Yeah, yeah. He says he starts off in chapter two. This is for you, O priest. In other words, he's not talking to the people. No. He says, you are cursed with a curse. He curses them two more times. <laughs> and then he says, I will spread dung in your faces at your feast. And he's talking to the priest. God is not mad at the people in Malachi. He's mad at the priest in Malachi. Yeah. It, when you get to chapter, the end of chapter two, he says, he says, you shed tears on the altar. Well, the priest the people did not go to the altar and shed tears. The altar burnt offerings. The pe- the priest did. The priest would take the people's sacrifice or their offering and get the blood or the meat or some part of it and go to the altar and offer it there. And I guess it was crocodile tears. He said, <laughs> you shed tears. So again, he's only talking to the priest. Yeah. And in chapter three, if anybody will read chapter three, verses one to five, he says he's talking about when Christ comes, he's going to go to the temple and cleanse what? Malachi three, verses one to five. He's going to, when Christ comes, he's going to go to the temple and cleanse the priesthood. He's still talking to the priest. Yeah, they they need a good talking to. That's for sure. A bunch of thieves. So when when you open up any book, even a pro tithing book, and they don't grasp the problem in verses eight and ten, they don't understand the hope the for the problem, because God would never ever tell you living in Tampa, Florida, to bring your tithes to Tallahassee, and every time you needed some food to go back up to Tallahassee to get your food. He would, he would say, that's crazy. <laughs> what kind of God would do that? <laughs> but, but, but every commentary falls for that, and every commentary I've ever seen says, oh, the problem is they weren't bringing all the tithes to the storehouse. They were keeping some at home. Yeah. So they doubled down. They doubled down on the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've, we've got a big problem. We've got a big problem, and uh, we hope to solve it. We hope to solve We We probably won't solve it in most of yeah. these fleecing centers they have out there because it's, it's, it's a fleecing center. People go to every Sunday, and the, the, the uh, guy up there is stealing your 10%, and then he's buying mansions and jet planes and Rolex watches, and it's horrible. Yeah, and next time you hear him do that, Remind them of Numbers eighteen twenty and the next nine repetitions of that. Now it's repeated over and over and over that the the, the Levites and the priests are not to amass wealth, yeah, and not to own property. And now, if they didn't serve in the temple, they could own property outside of Israel. Matter of fact, uh, in the New Testament, uh, it points out several Levites that own property and on, own islands and all that weren't inside Israel, but. It, 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 you just there's no correlation uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament here. Yeah, yeah. Well, are it, we like any people calling in? No, we don't have the call in feature on this uh, platform. Yeah. I'm on a new platform now on Spreaker. Well, I'm about to uh, talk out. <laughs> yeah, well, that that was good enough lesson for today, that's for sure. And, of course, you know, we'll bring you back again. Uh, have you been having any debates with anybody? Has anybody uh, taken you up on debating this topic lately? I'll tell you what. Uh, I don't know if you heard the name Joe Suggs. No. Well, he's supposed to have a program where he, he counsels middle-class millionaires. He counts, he counsels West wealthy people yeah. on how, how to use their money. And he contacted me about a year ago and said that uh, tithing comes up often and he's read my articles and he agrees with me and he was just gung ho to get me on his on his uh, uh, live TV. Oh. And so we set up a time and we 
I talked for about an hour on television. Uh, it's, it's on Google if you want to ever look it up. Yeah, Joe, well, how do you spell S-U-G- his name? S-U-G-G. Joe Sugg, Russell Kelly. Tyson. Okay. It's on Google. It's on Google. It's an hour long. Okay. Good. Thanks. Well, it, he was absolutely hilarious and happy. And he said, I got to get you on more often then. Let's do it again next week. Guess what? He disappeared off the face of the earth. I don't know what's happened to him. Wow. I hope he's alive. Uh, I think I'm afraid somebody that supported him said, if you have him on again, I'm not going to support you. I don't oh, know. Well, that happens. That happens. Yeah. It. But I thought this was this was my great opportunity to get somebody who who knows who's got influence with other people. Well, yeah, it would be great I, if if uh, you could be on some of these na- national broadcasts that they have and yeah. talk about it because we don't we we need these avenues where we can reach millions of people and television but, is really the best way. But you know they're not going to have yeah. me on, which I know, but they might well, have got, somebody with like you on with a debate. I would love to. Uh, people always contacting me saying that we want you to come here to debate, and I said I'll pay my own airfare. Yeah. Uh, you, you just give me a room and some food while I'm there. I'll pay. So this worth it to me. I, I'm I'm retired on disability and don't have much to do, and I'm getting too old. I hope my brain stays with me. Yeah, I exactly. I'm <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> into that. <laughs> Joe, Joe Sugg, I man, he was really on fire, and he gave me his email address and his telephone number, and he doesn't respond to any of that anymore. I hope he's still alive and healthy, and I pray for him. I, I'd love to hear from him again. Yeah, but well, we're going to put that invitation out. If you know anybody that wants to debate Russell Kelly, uh, please, uh, do you want to give your uh, website and how they can contact you? Well, it. The website is tithing-russkelly.com. That's simple. Okay. And, and my email go ahead. email is russkelly, phd, at yahoo.com. Okay. And my telephone number is area code 706-401-1276. Okay. All right. So you're comfortable putting your phone number out there? Yes, it's it's everywhere anyway. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right, Russ. Well, I want to thank you so much. I'll get this up on YouTube. It's a great interview. It's good to hear from you again. Thank you so much for coming on today. And God bless you. Shoot me an email. Tell me when it's there so I I can find it. I will. All right. And God bless you. Hey, if you want any uh, any extra speakers about prophecy or something, give me a call. I will. I will. I'm thinking of something. I have an idea. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. That's our program for today. And uh, we thank God for our brother, Russell Kelly, and for his many, many years of study on the subject of tithing. So we want to uh, give everybody the opportunity today to make the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Salvation is a simple process. You might say, well, I've done too many bad things in my life. I'm not good enough, but God will give you a brand new life. And he said he would forget all your sins. And as long as you ask Jesus to forgive you and you ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, he said in the third chapter of John that you must be born again. First, you're born of your mother. Then you must be born again of the Spirit of God. And you'll see, you'll see yourself once you ask Jesus into your life and you make him your Lord, you'll see how your life changes. It's a miracle. It's a miracle and it's a free gift and it's available to you today. So ask Jesus Christ to come into your life Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to be your Lord. And you'll see, he'll give you a brand new life full of peace and joy. Hallelujah. God bless you. If you have any questions, email me, Susan, 
at propheticnews.com. Thank you all my listeners worldwide. God bless you. Be the name of the Lord. He is my.